reported these and, and telling folks about them. Uh, and, and we're just thankful for uh, their expertise and want to encourage those of you that joined us today to contact your county extension educator. If you have questions about, uh, particularly if they're extension educator slash or comma ag, uh, they can answer a lot of questions and things that we're going to talk about here today. And if, you know, if they, if they uh, have a concern about the question, they know who to contact to help you with that. So uh, with that said, uh, uh, let me introduce uh, today's guest speaker, uh, Dr. Jared Decker. He is an associate professor there at the University of Missouri. Uh, Dr. Decker is well known across the country uh, early on in his career here as someone who has uh, uh, expertise in the, in the area of beef cattle genomics in particular, genetics, of course, but even, even more specifically in genomics. And he is one of the handful, handful of beef cattle genetics extension specialists left in the country. In fact, there are what, four, maybe five. Yeah, I, may, maybe six, soon to be okay, seven, six. I guess. So, All right, but there well, are not very many. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you might be right with five because I was just thinking of eBeef team members, but some of their appointments have changed. So you might be right with five. Okay, well that's that's good. But anyway, so we're 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 fortunate to have him. Uh, just just recognize that uh, not only is he an extension educator and he makes a, a habit of delivering useful information to folks across the country, he's also on the cutting edge. Okay, he, uh, he is doing some of the work that is leading the development of these new tools. He's doing some fascinating stuff. We're gonna hear about some of, those, uh, some of those projects here today. And Dr. Decker, we just wanna thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, we're thrilled to have you and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. All right, so, so the task that I was given today and, and was thrilled to talk to you all about was to discuss the genetics of fertility and specifically to talk about both existing tools and tools that are being developed. So one of the things that anybody who is involved with the beef industry recognizes is the beef industry is really proud of our tradition. We have a tradition of taking um, human inedible forage and converting it into nutrient dense, highly nutritious uh, beef for uh, the world to eat. And so this is a, a photo of, of my grandfather uh, selling a, a bowl in the Southwest Colorado Hereford Association um, sale. Um, that bull sold, sold very well that day. And, and so I think a lot about the, the, the tradition I have of doing things the right way in, in beef uh, production. Now, sometimes, especially those of you involved in extension, know that sometimes this tradition is a little bit of a double-edged sword and people get a little rooted and, and stuck in, in the ways they're doing things and are less receptive to, to new ways. But I think we really have to think about and perhaps change the lens in which we're thinking about this. One of the things that I mentioned there is my grandfather was really particular about doing things the right way. One of the things that I also think about and I think perhaps is an even better uh, value to have as a beef industry is what is the legacy we're leaving for the next generation? Are we doing things to the best of our ability so there's a strong and vibrant beef industry for the next generation to be a part of or are we doing things out of habit? Are we getting stuck in a rut? And we're gonna end up in a situation where beef production isn't as profitable as it should be. And there's not gonna be that, that legacy for the next generation. It's my hope, it's my belief 
that if we are open to innovation, if we are seeking to be the, 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 the most efficient and, and the best we can be, there will be that strong and vibrant beef industry. So how, how do we get there? How do we do it? I really like this, this one letter word, sustainability, this one word definition, sustainability, that really encompasses how we make sure there's a beef industry for the next generation. And I like the definition that NCBA uses. Uh, sustainability is environmental stewardship, making sure that we're responsibly using the resources and, and maintaining those resources. Social responsibility, producing beef in a way that our customers are comfortable consuming it, that our customers are comfortable making that purchase uh, when they go into the grocery store or, or out to a steakhouse. And then finally, uh, what, what ultimately drives the bus is beef production has to be profitable. If beef production isn't profitable, there, there's not an industry. There's not an industry for that next generation to be a part of. And so that's really what, what kind of drives everything I do in terms of research and extension is how can we make sure we're doing things sustainably. So today we're gonna to talk about the genetics of fertility. And these will kind of be the, the three main points that we hit on. First, we'll talk about selection on performance and, and the just be a spoiler alert. Uh, we'll talk about how that really uh, has some downfalls, has some limitations. We'll talk about selection on genetics and then we'll talk about some new research areas. So this is a slide that, that I stole slash borrowed from Megan Rolfe at Kansas State University when we were both uh, uh, graduate students at the University of Missouri. And so in this hypothetical scenario here, we have uh, these two bowls, okay? And let's imagine that they're both raised on the same ranch with the same management with the same opportunities for success. This bull on the left here, he has not very effectively turned this forage into, in, in, into muscle, into fat covering. Uh, he, he, he just leaves a lot to be desired phenotypically. Where this bull on the right, uh, he's definitely put on some, some flesh and, and some muscle. And so if these two bulls were raised in that same management in that same environment, it'd be pretty clear which to choose. Now let's say this bull on the left was raised in the desert Southwest where I'm from, where forage is extremely limited. You're, you're just hoping that those animals can go out and find the forage and, and, and consume it to, to move on and, and be productive. Whereas this bull on the right, he is, is still raised in a very lush environment with ample uh, feed resources. Now we can't tell whether the differences between these two bulls is due to their genetics and, and the potential they have to produce uh, profitable calves or if their differences is simply due to the environment and the management that they were grown in. So what this means is any time we make a selection decision based on how the animal performs or how the animal looks, it does not take into account those environment and management differences. What that ultimately means is when we try to make selection based on how the animal looks, their phenotype, it simply is going to be less accurate form of selection. And what happens is when we practice phenotypic selection, there's a hard ceiling on how accurate our selection decisions can be. And mathematically, that ceiling is the square root of the heritability for that trait. So if we think about a trait like birth weight, the heritability there is quite high. 46% uh, of the variation 
is attributed to additive genetics. So that ceiling on that phenotypic selection accuracy is a 0 0.68, okay? We can think about a different trait, marbling. Again, the heritability is, is quite high, but if we slaughter an animal, look at its carcass and, and measure the marbling, that animal is no longer available to be a bull, right? You, you can't use a carcass as the parent of the next generation unless you're gonna do something very technical and very expensive like cloning the animal, okay? So phenotypic selection for certain traits simply doesn't work. For other traits like fertility, the heritability is low enough that that ceiling on our selection accuracy is going to be very low, okay? So the heritability for a lot of fertility traits is gonna be between 5% and 15%. So a lot of variation in that trait is due to the animal circumstance, is due to factors other than additive genetics. So, so in that case, the ceiling on our selection accuracy, if we're selecting on phenotypes, is gonna be about 40%. So a lot of times when I'm discussing with beef producers and perhaps I have concerns about how they're making selection decisions specifically in regards to fertility and reproduction, I'll ask them, you know, how are you selecting for fertility? And they say, well, I'm calling all of the opens, right? And that's good, that's, that's helpful. But in terms of actually making genetic progress, that's gonna leave a lot to be desired. Uh, we're leaving a lot of value and information on the table when we focus on phenotypic selection for these lowly heritable traits and, and in fact, all traits uh, where an EPD is, is available. And so one of the points that we'll make to, to wrap up this slide is the ceiling on EPD accuracy is one. We can get to 100% accurate if we pour enough data and information into the process. And so when we select on genetics, we're no longer limited by the heritability of the trait. EPDs, we talk about EPD, EPD, and I think a lot of the meaning in that acronym gets lost very quickly. And so I always like to define this acronym to help people really get a handle about what we're talking about because this acronym is absolutely loaded with meaning. And the most loaded word is the E, which is for expected. Now, in, in cowboy terms, if we're talking about expected, we're talking about something we expect to happen in the future. And that's part of the definition here. But in EPD, we're using expected the way a statistician would use expected. So what expected actually means in this context is we're talking about the average, okay? So this should clue you into a point. When we're talking about EPDs, we're no longer talking about a single data point or a single animal. We're talking about the average of a large group of animals, okay? So what is that group of animals? That group of animals is the P for progeny. We're talking about the calves, the offspring out of that bull, okay? And we're, uh, so, 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 so the EPD is not a prediction of the animal's own performance. It's a prediction about how their calves, their offspring are going to perform. Finally, the D is for difference. If I give you the EPD profile of a single bull, and that's the only information I give you, that EPD profile is absolutely meaningless. It's worthless. We have to have two pieces of information to use an EPD. So we either have to be comparing two different animals, or we need to be comparing an animal to the breed average.
The other point that I think it's very easy for people to lose sight of is some measure of genetic similarity, some measure of, of relatedness is essential to calculating an EPD, okay? So, so we have this bell curve here of human height. And if all we have is the heights, we can't do anything to look at the genetic merit, the genetic value of, of, of the height of these individuals. However, if we have a measure of genetic similarity, now we can take this overall bell curve and split it into multiple bell curves. And we can split it into a bell curve for additive genetics and a bell curve for other sources of variation um, such as environment or management, or in this case of, of humans diets. And so what an EPD is, is the genetic effects that we've identified from looking at the genetic similarity of the animals in our data set. So that genetic similarity, whether it's pedigree information or DNA information is really a key piece of information needed to calculate an EPD. So how do EPDs actually work in practice? Uh, this is just a very simple example. Uh, we have two bulls here, the black bull and the gold bull. The black bull has a weaning weight EPD of 50 pounds. The gold bull has a weaning weight EPD of 70 pounds. That gold bull's EPD of 70 doesn't tell us anything about his individual performance. Obviously, he's not going to weigh 70 pounds at weaning, okay? So what we do is we breed the black bull to, to 100 cows, get a bunch of calves, and we measure the average of all of those calves. In the same farm, in the same environment, to the same cow base, we produce 100 calves out of the gold bull, okay? The average of the black bull's calves is 495 pounds. The average of the gold bull's calves is 515 pounds. There's a 20 pound difference in the EPDs of these two bulls. And that 20 pound difference in the EPDs predicts the 20 pound difference in the average performance of their offspring, of their progeny. We can look at this one other way. The, the black bull's average is here at 495. The gold bull's average is here at 515, okay? So that's what the EPD is predicting is the difference between these two. But it's important to remember that whenever we're dealing with genetics, whenever we're dealing with biology, we're dealing with randomness and variation. So there's going to be some of these gold bull calves that underperform the black bull average. And there's going to be some of these black bull calves that outperform the gold bull average. But what we do with EPDs is we move this bell curve whichever direction we want it to go. EPDs are just the tool. The direction in which they move is based on the decisions of the farmers and ranchers. I will tell you, if you leave this talk with no other information, leave it with this one point. Genetics and genomic prediction works. It absolutely works. It is a 40-year-old technology that has been proven time and time again. So either latch on to that idea and use it to be more profitable or perhaps step aside and let somebody who's gonna use the technologies we have on the shelf to produce high quality beef for our consumers who ultimately matter. So, so I apologize for getting a little preachy about that, but as an industry, we need to get to the point that we move on from this debate and figure out how to use this proven established technology to be more profitable. This is just a, a, a preprint 
So this is a paper that we're submitting for peer review that is available for you to look at. Uh, we, from one of our research centers, we compare the progeny performance to the cow's genomic prediction. And guess what? For every trait we look at, the genetic prediction statistically significantly predicts the calf performance. So if you're interested, you can, you can Google uh, this paper, read it, and it, it's also a great resource for anyone who's an extension educator and trying to help people get a handle on how we use genetics and genomics prediction. Okay, so luckily for us as a beef industry, we do have some tools that are available that allow us to make genetic improvement for fertility. So I'm gonna go over three of these tools. Um, the first is, is stability. Those are gonna be the, the dozen uh, different breeds that are part of Semitol's International Genetic Solutions Evaluation. So those are gonna be breeds like Semitol, Red Angus, Gelvy, Limousine, Shorthorn, um, others that I'm, I'm leaving out. The second is sustained cow fertility. Uh, that's basically Hereford's version of a stability EPD. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk about heifer pregnancy EPDs. So stability is defined as the percent probability that a bull's daughters will stay productive uh, at, within the herd for at least, till at least six years of age, okay? So for stability in IGS, the goal that they're trying to get to is six years of age. Um, previously, we used to have to wait till a cow got to six years of age or did not get to six years of age till she contributed to that genetic evaluation. We've now started using different statistical models that we call a random regression. And that allows us to take all different ages of cows into, into account and allows us to use more of the data and produces a more accurate stability EPD. So as uh, IGS and Semitol uh, started to make some of these changes to the evaluation, uh, they put together some educational materials about if stability uh, actually works. So it's important to keep in mind that with stability, the phenotype, the observation that we're recording is either success or failure of becoming pregnant and having a calf, okay? And we do that to, to, to be considered a success, that cow has to do that year after year after year until six years of age, okay? So as I mentioned, uh, Drs. Colbertson and Atkins at International Genetic Solution uh, put together this nice article. And I've just pulled out uh, two of the graphs that they showed in that article. So here on the x-axis, they've grouped bulls, sires, into four classes. Okay, so the best 25%, 26th percentile to 50th percentile, 51st percentile, the 74th percentile, and the bottom 25% the 75th and below percentile, okay? And what you can see is that for these top ranking bulls, uh, nearly 50% of their daughters remained in the herd as six-year-olds compared to these bottom ranking bulls, which only 22% of their daughters had stayed in the herd um, as, as six-year-olds. So basically, uh, we, we see a, we, we see 27% more uh, daughters of these high ranking bulls staying in the herd. They also showed us this information a different way. So this is the average number of calves produced by these daughters, by these cows in their lifetime. And so the uh, top ranking bulls their daughters produced about 4.8 calves in their lifetime on average, compared to the low ranking bulls 
whose daughters produced about 2.8 calves. And so these high ranking bulls daughters are producing about two more calves in their lifetime compared to the low ranking bulls daughters, okay? So not only do we just produce numbers with these genetic predictions, but these genetic predictions predict real world performance. And so we actually see fertility outcome differences between these sets of, of animals based on their stability EPD. And so I'm gonna keep beating this message throughout the talk, but the stability EPD works. Are you using it? If not, why aren't you using it? What opportunities are you leaving on the table by, by not using it? So I just invite you to, to do some of that uh, high dollar reflection work, looking at your production systems. And is there an opportunity here for you to change your decision-making process to identify more profitable cattle for your herd? That's one of the things that I really like about genetics is, is we don't necessarily have to spend more to get more. We can simply change the way in which we're making a decision, change the priorities or the information we're using to make a decision, and that can help us be more profitable. As I said, sustained cow fertility is the Hereford Association's measure of stability. Again, the observation here is success or failure. failure. They're also using a random regression model. But the difference here is, is one, they're having their producers report uh, why a cow was called. Um, so, so they're limiting it just to those cows that were called because she was open. And two, they're requiring that those, the goal here is instead of the cow getting to six years of age, the goal in this analysis is the, is the cow gets to 12 years of age. We also have heifer pregnancy EPDs available. Again, the observation here is success or failure. Did the heifer get pregnant as a one-year-old and calve as a two-year-old? They collect various uh, data is needed. So you need to know when the breeding season began, when it ended, if the heifer was actually exposed and did she become pregnant. And so the definition here is the ability of a sire's daughter to conceive and calve at two years of age. So this allows us to identify those sires who are going to produce more fertile uh, heifers. So, so we've talked about the various EPDs that are available to you as a cattle producer. There's also a, another very important uh, selection strategy or, or, or breeding decision that can help the fertility of your herd. And that's simply crossbreeding, okay? A crossbred cow is gonna be 25% more productive uh, over her lifetime. And, and much of that improvement in uh, productivity is going to be due to higher uh, fertility, okay? So crossbreeding is, is, is definitely an opportunity for you to improve your production system. Of course, that doesn't work for everyone. There's some situations where a producer has identified perhaps for specific marketing endpoints that they want to straight breed. If you are going to straight breed, I think it becomes even more important that you're practicing selection decisions and, and selecting for more fertile females. If you're gonna give up the fertility gains from crossbreeding, then you better be selecting for it using EPDs to identify those more fertile bloodlines to bring into your herd. So we're gonna transition now in, into um, future directions, so, so what opportunities are coming in the pipeline? But just to conclude uh, this previous part, 
is the existing tools we have work, okay? But the question becomes, can we do better? And in my opinion, and, and part of the reason we're, we're focusing on this research area is I think the answer is a resounding yes, we can do better. So one area that we're starting to see research come is trying to identify embryonic lethals. And what we do here is look for strings of DNA variants. We call these haplotypes that are inherited together. And we look for these strings of DNA variants that are never observed in two copies. What this means is that this haplotype is carrying a DNA variant that is causing embryos to, to be aborted, okay? So these are what we call recessive DNA variants, meaning if you inherit one copy, the fetus and eventually the calf is fine, okay? However, if you inherit two copies, the embryo or the fetus is aborted. And typically we think that a lot of these pregnancy losses are happening early on, you know, in, in the first uh, couple of weeks of, of pregnancy, these, these embryos are, are being lost. So what this means is instead of that cow getting pregnant early in the breeding season, she loses that calf, gets rebred, and now calves towards the back end of, of the breeding season. If, if, if that happens multiple times, she of course is gonna fall out of the herd. The dairy industry has been uh, using these embryonic lethals and managing them for uh, a long time. Um, an important thing they've done is they've not given a name to any of these embryonic lethal haplotypes that they've identified. They simply give it an acronym, HH1 or JH1. They never give it a name because they don't want people overreacting to them and, and trying to uh, call, get rid of any carriers. In the beef industry, Jerry Taylor and David Patterson have had a grant for several years uh, looking at this in beef cattle. Angus Genetics Incorporated, uh, a, a subsidiary of the American Angus Association is also working on this. They've identified a couple of candidates that, that they've found and, and they're working to, to validate those and make sure that they have sufficient information um, to, to start reporting those to producers. And so they, they put together a nice Angus University uh, webinar about this, and you can get the link to that webinar uh, on my blog. And I think um, uh, Dr. Lawman will, will make all of these slides available later on, so you'll be able to access um, the, the links that are in my slides. So one of the things that I just want to iterate here is these embryonic lethals are not boogeymen hiding under the bed, okay? We do not need to be scared of them. We need to manage them like adults and, and just have kind of some clear thinking and, and some realism about, about how we get around them. And so simply what we do is we avoid mating carriers to carriers. In the dairy industry, if a cow is an HH2 carrier, you don't mate her to an HH2 carrier bull. Now you can mate her to an HH12 bull, but you wouldn't mate her to an HH12 uh, uh, bull, excuse me. In the beef industry, uh, these embryonic lethals are possibly uh, another benefit we see from crossbreeding. Most of these embryonic lethals are likely to be breed specific. And so uh, we're gonna get a benefit of avoiding them by simply crossbreeding. Okay, so now we're gonna continue on, on the future directions and start talking about some research that my group has just started this past June. And so in talking with beef producers, um, 
there's obviously improvements that we can make to the prediction of fertility traits. So one weakness is in the beef industry right now, we don't have any predictions of early puberty, okay? We see very few records that are turned in. So for the longest time, the least accurate genomic prediction was for heifer pregnancy. And it wasn't anything intrinsic. It wasn't any special characteristic about heifer pregnancy. It was simply that the Angus Association had fewer heifer pregnancy data turned in uh, to the, use in the evaluation. The other thing is, is you'll notice as we talked about stayability and we talked about heifer pregnancy, we were always talking about binary success or failure. So there's actually very little information content there. And it would be much nicer if we actually had quantitative measures of fertility that gave us more information. The other weakness that we sometimes hear when talking with beef producers is we're, or, or reproductive physiologist is we're not giving any credit to those females who conceive early in the breeding season. Um, I, I think last week, Dr. Prather talked about this some, that, that we really need to be identifying those females that are getting bred early in the breeding season. So, so that was um, part of the goal that, that my group wanted to tackle is, is how do we get around some of these issues? So if we think about beef cattle breeding, how have we got around uh, some of these other difficult traits? And typically what we do is we use multiple trait models, okay? So one example of this is calving ease, okay? Calving ease is again, a sex success failure phenotype, a success failure trait. And many times we have no variation within a contemporary group for calving ease. We might have a set of heifers and all of them deliver unassisted, okay? So from a management perspective, that's great. From a genetic prediction perspective, that's not helpful information because we've not identified any genetic differences within that group. But for calving ease, we have this great indicator trait of birth weight. We know that lighter calves tend to be born easier, okay? So that birth weight in and of itself is not important. Nobody is getting paid or having a cost directly due to birth weight. Birth weight's value comes in as an indicator of calving ease. Carcass traits have also been difficult to predict. Uh, you know, as we talked about in the beginning, once you slaughter an animal, it becomes very difficult to use that animal as a parent of the next generation. And so what we did is we identified ultrasound carcass data as a high quality indicator of actual carcass performance, okay? The other thing that we've done in genetic predictions is we've added weaning weight to our carcass trait models. What that does is that it accounts for the fact that our carcass and ultrasound data is not a random sample of the population. And it's not a complete sample of the population. It's an incomplete and biased sample of the population. But by including weaning weights as a correlated trait in that model, it accounts for um, those biases and that incompleteness and makes our carcass trait EPDs uh, more accurate, more reliable. So we pitched that we needed to create quantitative measures of fertility and puberty. We needed to tackle puberty and, and we could do all of this to make more accurate genetic predictions of heifer puberty and fertility. And so we pitched this for several years. We were very persistent with the USDA, but we finally convinced them to fund this project. And so now we've got a, a, a four-year project to try to tackle puberty and fertility in beef heifers. And so uh, these blog posts here describe what we're doing to try to recruit heifers 
uh, to this project, and we'll go over that as well in this in this uh, presentation. So as I've talked about, it's all about improving the prediction of heifer puberty and fertility. Uh, Dr. Prather last week talked about reproductive track scores. Reproductive track scores are a direct measurement of a heifer's puberty status. By collecting enough reproductive track scores, so by collecting thousands and thousands of reproductive track scores, that allows us and, and, and attaching relatedness, genetic similarity data to those performance data, it allows us to create an EPD for puberty status. The other thing that happens as these heifers start to reach puberty is their pelvis, their, their pelvic area grows rapidly. When they, from before puberty to after puberty, we see this rapid pulse of, of pelvic growth. And so the pelvic measurements, the pelvic width and the pelvic height are also telling us about the puberty status of those animals. Uh, we're going to be looking at a trait that's called days open. What days open mean is from the start of the breeding season, how many days did it take for that heifer to become pregnant? The, the best is that it took her zero days. The breeding season starts and she gets bred on day one of the breeding season. That's ideal. Uh, so that's what this trait of days open is, is measuring, is when in the breeding season did that heifer become pregnant. And then as we model and fit all of these traits together, does the genetic uh, evaluation, does the genetic prediction improve? So if you're interested or you have clients that are interested in participating in this research, uh, we outline everything. We give a really nice roadmap about what it looks like to participate in this program on, on my blog. But basically the high points is we need to, you to collect four pieces of information. And three of those pieces of information are gonna come at the pre-breeding exam. That pre-breeding exam uh, needs to happen at least 30 days prior to the start of the breeding season. We prefer for it to happen 30 to 45 days uh, from the start of the breeding season but we're willing to stretch it out uh, even earlier in, in certain cases. But that 30 to 45 day window is, is kind of ideal. At that pre-breeding exam, we need you to collect a DNA sample, the pelvic measurements, and a reproductive track score, okay? So then 90 days after the start of the breeding season, you're gonna do another evaluation with your veterinarian and they're going to measure ultrasound. They're going to use ultrasound to measure fetal age. And so it's important that the pregnancy check is not done by palpation, but done by ultrasound. And it can't just be open or bred. We actually need to know the fetal age because that fetal age is what's telling us when in the breeding season did the heifer conceive that allows us to calculate that day's open. The other point is we require whole herd reporting. So if you're, if, if you're developing 100 heifers, we need data on all 100, okay? You can't pick and choose which data you're going to send us. We want that complete picture of your, of your group. Uh, the producer pays the veterinarian to do the, the pre-breeding exam. The grant pays for, for a blood card or TSU and for the DNA testing. And what happens is, is the breeder sends us the DNA sample and the phenotypic records. We then with the grant pay for that to be genotyped, the DNA sample to be genotyped. We then share of a copy of the genotype with the breed association. And that means the producer then gets genomic enhanced EPDs for free uh, for participating in the, in the program. Just really briefly, here's the five different reproductive track scores. What we see is as we move from a one to a five is that the ovary and follicle sizes increase. These heifers that are a reproductive track score one 
have very poor pregnancy outcomes in terms of uh, uh, pregnancy rate from fixed time AI. Uh, this is part of the data that led us to believe that there was a relationship between these reproductive tract score and, and pregnancy outcomes. Uh, some of the early results that we've had as, as part of uh, this research is that we, uh, our, our hypothesis, our, our, our belief that days open had more information uh, than simple binary yes, no heifer pregnancy appears to be correct. We're seeing higher heritabilities uh, with our days open. We see a mild genetic correlation between reproductive tract score and days open. Uh, part of this is because most of the data that we had historically was from heifers who are synchronized using a 14-day cedar protocol. That 14-day cedar protocol will induce cyclicity in prepubertal or peripubertal heifers. So that could be part of what's weakening that relationship. As part of the research grant, we're getting a much broader set of data uh, and many of the heifers now collected in the grant have not been part of a synchronization protocol. So we might see a stronger genetic correlation when those heifers are not developed with a 14-day cedar. And then of course, we see that genetic correlation between pelvic measurements and reproductive tract score. Uh, in, in, in January or February, we're gonna start a National Center for Applied Reproduction and Genomics seminar series. Uh, and in one of those, we're gonna talk about how veterinarians can kind of see this as a service of collecting data and reporting data for genetic predictions. Like I said, we're recruiting heifers. We're recruiting about 2,500 Red Angus heifers and 2,500 Hereford heifers. If you're interested, please get in contact with me or Jordan Thomas. And so the conclusions to, to wrap up, whenever possible, use EPDs uh, over phenotypes. And this is especially true for those lowly heritable traits like fertility. But it's important to keep in mind that the phenotypes are an essential piece of predicting EPDs. So if you're a seed stock producer, you need to be reporting those phenotypes into the breed association. Uh, the fertility trait EPDs work. You can use them to identify more fertile females. And uh, we're working uh, feverishly to, to catch up and, and try to create genetic predictions and genomic predictions that are more accurate for these highly, uh, for, for these traits like puberty and fertility that are big profit drivers in the beef industry. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you all may have. Very good. <clears throat> Excellent information, Dr. Decker. Uh, before we get too far away from your project here, I've got a couple. I uh, see we've got one question in the Q&A here. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to type your questions either in the Q&A or the chat. And Dr. Biggs and I will get to those uh, while we've still got uh, Dr. Decker here with us. So what about, um, uh, so just to make, make sure everyone's clear, you're recruiting red Angus and Hereford heifers, whether purebred or crossbred, it looks like. Do they, does, do they have to be a red Angus by Hereford crossbred animals or the other way around? Um, that would probably be preferred. Um, you know, if, if it's a commercial animal, we would probably prefer it to either be like a straight bred Red Angus or a straight bred Hereford. Um, if we know they're Hereford sired or Red Angus sired, those could possibly also work for the project. But um, um, the preference would be for, for those two, for a Red Baldy or, or a commercial straight bred. Okay. Okay, so in our in our type questions thus far, first one is uh, what what are the well is there an antagonism for selecting for fertility traits? Are there any identified antagonisms? Yeah, so so one of the things that we've uh, seen it's turned around in in recent years, but whether it's the dairy industry or the beef industry 
is if we're not selecting for fertility, we're going to be lose. We're going to be going in the wrong direction in terms of our genetic trend. And so, if we're if we're not paying attention to it, it's going to go in the wrong direction. In terms of of genetic ant antagonisms, you know, there, there's not any any super strong genetic antagonisms. That's one of the things that's a real benefit of genetic prediction is if an antagonism does exist, we can get around it or break it by uh, selecting on the EPDs of both traits. A great example of this is calving ease and growth. Uh, we can break that genetic antagonism between birth weight and, and yearling weights by simply selecting on those on those two EPDs. So, so selecting on calving ease and selecting on yearling weight, we can we can get around or, or break that genetic antagonism. Uh, one of the things that I didn't talk about is um, uh, early in, in one of our previous projects, uh, Mike McNeil did an analysis where he looked at Hereford cows who uh, failed to rebreed as a three-year-old versus those that had produced three or more calves, okay? So uh, cows with low stability and cows with high stability. And between those two groups, he looked for significant differences in their EPD profiles. And one of the traits that was significantly different between the two was uh, carcass fat thickness, okay? Those cows that had higher genetic potential for fat, fat thickness uh, tended to stay in the herd longer. So what this means is, is this old, uh, you know, the, the, the cowboy uh, jargon of easy fleshing uh, holds up. Uh, cows with higher genetic potential uh, for, for greater um, fat thickness tend to stay around longer. Uh, so, th so that would be one antagonism is, is if we're looking for kind of uh, high yield grade cattle, uh, those might also have a harder time being easy fleshing um, as cows. And more recent genetic correlations, does that still hold or are you able to evaluate that? Uh, we've not looked at that since, I don't know, 2017, so. Okay. All right, so this is a good one. What impact does scrotal circumference have on puberty and heifers? Yeah, so, so for a long time we said, okay, scrotal circumference is, is easy to measure. Let's throw that in as our fertility trait in our genetic evaluation. In terms of stability and heifer pregnancy, the relationship between scrotal circumference and, and those kind of female outcomes is going to be almost meaningless. Okay. Now the, the Dave did, did identify that scrotal circumference has been shown to be related to age of puberty in, in heifers. And most of the research that I looked at uh, 13 years ago, uh, that relationship was uh, especially strong for Boss Indicus cattle. So obviously when we're talking about Boss Indicus cattle, they tend to, the females tend to reach puberty later. It's not uncommon for, for Boss Indicus females for the target for them to have their first calf at three years of age. So, so there in, in Boss Indicus, the relationship between scrotal circumference and age of pu at puberty and heifers is is quite strong. Um, in in Bos Taurus animals, it's it's probably a weaker relationship. Um, and in terms of heifer pregnancy and stability outcomes, basically no relationship. Well, that that's important, and I think still misunderstood throughout a lot of our industry. So I'm glad that question was asked. I'm glad you're able to cover it. All right, so another participant asks, uh, why are Angus cattle not included in your heifer project? Yeah, uh, that was an oversight on, 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 on my part. So we have historical, so I talked about the uh, leaf, embryonic lethal grant that Dave Patterson and Jerry Taylor led. As part of that project, 
they uh, DNA tested 10,000 heifers, 10,000 Angus heifers. Of those 10,000 Angus heifers, about 6,000 of them have the reproductive tract score and ultrasound data that we're using in this project. So in addition to the 2,500 Red Angus, the 2,500 Hereford will have 6,000 uh, Black Angus animals in that as well. Uh, we've also had some discussions with AGI about expanding this research into uh, many, many more uh, Black Angus um, animals. So, so we are working in, in Angus as well, in addition to the Red Angus and, and the Hereford. Uh, one of the things that happened is, as I mentioned, we submitted this proposal multiple times. In early rounds of proposals, uh, we proposed to do this in lots of different breeds and the, the feedback from the peer review is we needed to focus on a small number of breeds. So that's unfortunately why we're only looking at three breeds right now. Uh, we'd love to look at more breeds and if any uh, breed associations want to collaborate with us, we'd, we'd love to do so. All right, Dr. Biggs, do we have, <clears throat> maybe it looks like maybe there's a question in the chat. I think we've got everything in, in the chat. Uh, we did have one comment, maybe a producer that's interested in participating in the study. So Dr. Decker, if you don't mind, do you mind throwing that contact information slide back up? That way, if anybody needed to jot that down, they would have it. Uh, we do have one additional um, a question in the Q&A, does the cost sharing of the DNA occur with Angus is the question. Yeah, so right now for our USDA funded project, we only have funding to, to DNA test Red Angus and Hereford heifers at this time. So, so at, at this time, we're, we're not able to do to other breeds just because of what we propose to do with the USDA. But like I said, we'd, we'd love to do that. If, you know, if, if you're an Angus breeder, get in touch with your board of director that, that you work with and, and just tell them, you know, you support AGI collaborating with Dr. De Decker's group at Mizzou. So I have uh, another question or two here for you, Dr. Decker. Um, one, one thing is related to the heritability of fertility traits. I see that, uh, you know, the Meat Animal Research Center's paper on lifetime productivity, I think that's a proper term, uh, but their heritability in, in, in that trait is substantially higher than what we usually think about as a as a typical heritability and fertility what what do you what do you think of that yeah that's that that that's an interesting observation um so one caveat i guess i should say is heritabilities are always context specific so so a heritability in one breed may not reflect the heritability in a different breed. And um, the heritability in one environment may not reflect the heritability in a different environment or under different management. So at that USDA Mark uh, Research Center, all of those cows are gonna be in the same environment under the same, same management. The other thing that is interesting is, is I assume in that research, I've, I've not looked at that paper, uh, but I assume in that research is they're using the cows from the Germplasm Evaluation Consortium, uh, the Germplasm Evaluation. So a lot of those are going to be uh, crossbred cow, if that's the data they're using, it's gonna be crossbred cows from 14 different breeds and so I would wonder to what effect um, have, they, uh, have they modeled the heterosis and, and taken care of those heterosis impacts uh, and how does that affect their heritability estimate? Okay, very good. 
<clears throat> and I, as I recall, I think you're correct. I, I believe that uh, paper is based on the, the crossbred population there. The last observation I I'm, would like to have you comment on, I guess, is the tremendous uh, progress that appears, as I recall, the uh, sustainability EPD. Um, I, I guess it was what longevity for a while in what Simmental maybe. Okay, yeah. Uh, but anyway, they've been around for what twenty years, twenty plus. Yeah. And, and the genetic trends are very impressive. Yes, yes, that's a great point. So, so that's something I I, I should have emphasized in my talk is when we're thinking about heritability that puts a limit on our genetic progress if we're doing phenotypic selection. However, once we calculate an EPD, heritability no longer applies because the heritability of an EPD is 100%. It's, it's all additive genetic variation. And so once we get to the point that we have, a her, have an EPD, we can make rapid genetic progress even for lowly heritable traits. The key with lowly heritable traits is we need to have accurate measures of genetic similarity. We have that now with DNA testing and we need lots of data coming in. And, and for breed associations that require things like whole herd reporting, we can get a lot of that data collected quickly. So that's really the two keys to any EPD is getting accurate measures of genetic similarity and getting lots of high quality phenotypic data in. We've seen the same thing in the dairy industry is, is their rate of genetic progress for fertility traits has been quite rapid once they started producing genetic predictions for those traits and putting those genetic predictions into their selection indexes. Okay, well, very good. Uh, Dr. Biggs, do you have anything else before we wrap it up here this afternoon? No, sir, just want to uh, highlight Dr. Decker's blog that you had put in the chat in case folks want to take a look at that. The, uh, the address is there, but that's all I have. And I think we've got all the questions wrapped up. We just had right. one pop up. All right. Okay, so the question by uh, Dave is using crossbreeding to get around lethal traits. What about the use of other breeds, Angus, into mini breeding, Sim Angus, Limflex, et cetera, and its impact on this? Uh, that's a very great observation. So as we've seen kind of the, the, uh, the, the influence of Angus cattle on these other breed associations, what we've seen is, is if something becomes a problem in Angus, it also becomes an issue uh, that we need to manage in the other breeds as well. So whether we're talking about um, genetic abnormalities that we're testing for or embryonic lethals or whatnot. Um, now the, the one caveat is we still have retained heterosis when we're using these hybrid bulls, right? So um, it's not that the heterosis has gone completely away. So, so perhaps that would limit the degree to which this would be a concern, um, but it, it, it could still possibly, you know, uh, limit the impact of crossbreeding on, on improving our fertility. So, you know, if, if that's something you're concerned about, you can simply uh, set up a crossbreeding program where you're not using a hybrid bull. Um, you know, you're, you're using uh, a Sim Angus bull on a set of, of, of Hereford cows, or you're using Angus on Hereford or, or whatever it may be. So, but like I said, we still have plenty of retained heterosis when we're using those hybrid bulls. So probably not a huge concern. 
little bit of a rambling answer. Sorry. <clears throat> That's a good question. So, yeah. uh, just to re as a reminder, we're we're gonna close we're gonna uh, close up shop here in just a minute. But uh, Dr. Decker's already shared his slide set with us today uh, in a PDF format. We're gonna get that posted next to the link of this video of his presentation here today. As always, those are available at beef.okstate.edu. So uh, we're gonna take a few weeks off here for the holidays. Uh, we'll hope to see you on Thursday, January 7th at 1230. Uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Stay safe, Merry Christmas. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Dr. Decker.